Greetings. We hope your week is beginning very positively. Chag Sameach. This is the fourth day of the Festival of Tabernacles, and uh, we hope that uh, it's going well for you wherever you are. So if you're uh, viewing this, uh, we're here in the hills of eastern Tennessee. Gather around the fireplace. Be relaxed, casual, because I'm just folks like y'all. <laughs> but uh, I do have something I want to tell you. But before I do, there's a story I'd like to pass on. It's about a very devout evangelical girl, but she was unfortunately had to be in the public school system, and she had a very cynical uh, teacher. And uh, he said to her, do you really believe that Jonah was swallowed by a whale? And so she said, well, when I get to heaven, I'll ask him. So the teacher said, well, what if he's in hell? And the girl said, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> I talked, uh, there are many miracles in the Bible, and there are many miracles in the book I want to talk about today. You can, talk, you can call this discussion Mark on Mark. But I want to call this discussion Our Active Savior. But the book of Mark presents Jesus Christ as our active Savior. It's a book with many miracles, but it's a book that moves right along at a very active pace. So I talked about relaxing before. Actually, it's not necessarily relaxing to read the book of Mark. It's a book, uh, it's a book of action, our active Savior. It has the word ephthes in the Greek, immediately, or how, in various ways it's translated, but it's there 41 times, the word immediately in just those 16 chapters, and evidently 11 times in the first chapter, so you get the idea that you're going at a hectic pace. What's the point of that? Well, it possibly two come to mind. One, to show that Christ is active, and also to show that his ministry was really not, from a, a historical point of view, a very long one. His, the human ministry, the time he spent with us, in, it was three and a half years, and uh, so it was, in, in that sense, short but very uh, intense. If you go back to the roots, uh, first of all, a couple of comments on, on Mark. Uh, traditionally, it was written by, you know, people, the early church thought that it was written by the, the evangelist Mark who worked with the apostle Peter. And even though scholars questioned that, it would make sense to me because here we have Luke, Paul's personal physician, and he writes a gospel and would think, you'd think that Peter would also have a gospel written under his influence. So it would make sense to me. But uh, the roots of, of but in Mark seems to be written for a Gentile audience. Many people feel that the audience was intended was was in Rome, uh, and uh, there's not the same, uh, perhaps, some of the technicalities of of Jewish tradition you read about in other in other parts of the, of the New Testament. Although there are, although you do find some here, and there are very important Old Testament roots to what Mark is talking about. And one of the things to think about, one of the important concepts to, to remember is how God has worked over the centuries in terms of publicizing his uh, approach to life, his way of life, and his plan for humanity. He has often done so, done so through a pattern of pairs of, of speakers, uh, pa uh, pairs of prophets, witnesses, two witnesses. You know, as the, as the Bible says, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, a decision is made. So you have the Old Testament and the New Testament, you know, and you have the, uh, as I said, through the Bible, you have, um, you have Enoch and Noah. Uh, you have um, Moses and, and Aaron. Oh, but let me put it another way. In terms of, of age, you have Aaron and Moses. Aaron was a little older than Moses. You have Caleb and Joshua. Uh, you have the two spies uh, that were sent uh, by Joshua. You have um, Zechariah and Haggai. You have Zerubbabel and Joshua. So you have these various pairs. And uh, the, the Moses and Aaron model eventually becomes Moses and Elijah. Evidently, Elijah was a priest. And uh, in the tradition of, of Phinehas, the very zealous uh, grandson of Aaron, and so you have Moses and Elijah. And when the Old Testament prophecies end in the book of Malachi, we see Moses and Elijah there. And then in Matthew 17 and wherever, you know, you, you also see that 
vision in other places, but the vision of uh, on a transfiguration, you see Moses and Elijah there with Jesus. So you have this pattern of two witnesses, an older priestly figure and a young, more perhaps personable figure <laughs> and, and uh, who, who, uh, who eclipses the, uh, the other one in a way, but they, they work together in a certain sense. When we come to the end of, of history, we have again two witnesses, and in Revelation 11, if you read about them, they're behaving very much like Moses and Elijah, and they're, they're in effect uh, antitypes of, of those two. Moses is a type of one, and, and uh, Elijah a type of the other. And at the time of Jesus Christ, we had that pair. We had John the Baptist, a priest, coming as an Elijah-like figure, and then we had Jesus Christ as the Elisha figure. You know, we had Elijah and Elisha. And what did Elisha say to Elijah uh, before Elijah was taken away? You know, kind of semi-retirement, however you want to put it. Uh, he, he said to him, I want a double portion of your spirit. And, and that's what happened. And so you see many, many miracles performed by Elisha. Elijah did great miracles, but you see many more performed by Elisha. And that's the, that's the pattern with John and Jesus Christ. John the Baptist, if you read the book of John, the Gospel of John didn't do any miracles, but Jesus Christ did so many miracles. And evidently in the book of Mark, the analogy is made of, of Elijah and Elisha. And many of the miracles of Jesus Christ in the book of Mark are, are kind of foreshadowed uh, by what Elisha does. You could do a, a very interesting study of Elisha's career and Jesus Christ's career in the book of Mark. So that's some background to what I'm about to read now. Uh, first, let me say that Mark defines the gospel for us. What does the church proclaim? And that's, that's really defined in Mark very clearly. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So we see what we're reading about here in Mark 1.1. 1, 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Then it's defined in the 15th verse, verse very clearly. And, uh, and uh, let's go to verse 14. Now, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So the gospel is the gospel of the kingdom of God, that God is going to actually intervene and there's going to be the kingdom of God, Jesus Christ as the king, the world as the territory, the people of the world as the subjects and God's law as the law of that kingdom. You know, those elements are part of what the church is supposed to be explaining to the world. So I want to go now and read, read just highlights from the Gospel of Mark, as I said, showing Jesus Christ as our active Savior. I want to go to uh, Acts, to Mark 1. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets. So now we have this prophecy in Malachi. Behold, I will send my messenger. And that's what Malachi means, my messenger. Behold, I will send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. And then from Isaiah 40, verse 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the, of the Lord, make his path straight. So we have first the ministry of John the Baptist talked about here. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Then all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River confessing their sins. So you see, this the, the Elijah to come really did have a major following, and particularly the Jewish community recognized him and was very influenced by him. And that's also what's going to happen in the end time with the two witnesses. There will be an Elijah-like figure who will be very, uh, very he'll have a very big impact on the Jewish community of that time, whenever that time comes. Now John was clothed with camels here, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. So he, as I said, an Elijah-like figure. If you read about Elijah's career, there's parallels there. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. You know, so the way is being prepared for Jesus Christ. I indeed baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And immediately, and you'll, you'll hear that word a lot, coming up from the water, he saw the heavens parting and the Spirit descending upon him as like a dove. Then a voice came from heaven, 
You are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Immediately the spirit drove him into the wilderness. Uh, and uh, so we have, a, a, in effect, a compact statement of what went on. It's, it's, it, a lot is packed in, 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 in a short, in, in a, let's say a terse um, account. Uh, verse 13, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan and was with the wild beasts and the angels and the angels ministered to him. And I already read uh, verse uh, 14 and 15. And then we see the calling of some of the original uh, apostles. Verse 16. And as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. <coughs> Excuse me. Then Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you, uh, and I will make you become fishers of men. Then immediately, they left immediately. I'm sorry, they immediately left their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, and uh, who were also in the boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat and the hired servants and went after him. Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So his approach was very different because this was the word of God in the flesh. Uh, and so he, he spoke in, a, in an authoritative way because he had given the law in the first place. So obviously he understood what, it, what he meant by what he gave. You know, so he did. He spoke in a manner different from the rabbis who had these discussions and debates and analysis. Uh, and uh, he obviously he had a tremendous impact. And as I said, in this book we have many miracles that he did. And and of course there, there's a point, for example, in the in Mark three, one of the miracles he does there is to illustrate the Sabbath, that. Uh, the Sabbath is not intended to, to be, in effect, onerous or uh, a burden, you know, as in Mark 2. You know, he, well, I'll, let me go to Mark 2. I'll go to the uh, end of that, of that second chapter of Mark. He says, and he said to them, this is Mark 2, 27, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So, yes, the Sabbath was a, a blessing God gave human beings. To compel us <laughs> you know to rest on the seventh day uh, because you know we need it you know whether we understand it or not we need it physically and spiritually and so the sabbath was made for man and not man for the sabbath therefore the son of man is also lord of the sabbath so in other words as i as the representative of the human race having given the human race the sabbath can explain to you how best to keep it and that's what he shows in mark 3 that you can do good on the sabbath See, the, the, the Pharisaic approach to the, to, to the Sabbath was that, you know, here's a man who, 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 is, who had this affliction for all these years. Well, couldn't he wait till, till the stars come out? And then couldn't he wait another few hours? Uh, he's waited this long. <laughs> but Jesus said, why should I make him continue to extend this misery uh, several more hours when I can do it now? Uh, you know, even if, so it's the Sabbath, but he's, he's, he's afflicted and I can relieve his affliction immediately. So why wait till, you know, all these hours and, and prolong his agony, as it were? Um, chapter 3. And he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so they might, that they might accuse him. You know, as I said, you know, if you can simply, re, you know, relieve his suffering, why make him wait any longer? That, but that was their approach, uh, as we understand. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, step forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath day to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. And when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored as whole as the other. Now you'd think they would be very impressed you know, by such a miracle, here a man's been healed. And what was the reaction? That now they saw him as a threat. Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians, uh, people who were supporting the Herodian dynasty. In effect, 
You know, they say politics means make strange bedfellows. These people should not be in, necessarily in collusion with each other. But, but when it came to Jesus Christ, they were. Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. So here this wonderful miracle occurs, but those who felt threatened uh, looked at it as, as something that, you know, that, that was a problem rather than, than a blessing. I want to go now to the fourth chapter of Mark and verse 35. On the same day, Mark 4 and verse 35, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as, as he was, and, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. And by the way, reading this reminds me that here again we in America are experiencing a hurricane, Nate. So keep in mind those who are being impacted by that hurricane, maybe even some fee scores are being impacted. Verse 38, but he was in the stern asleep on a pillow. And they awoke and said to him, teacher, do you not care what we, what we are, are, that we are perishing? So this was a bit of a test for them and their faith in, in, in him, uh, their mentor, their, their teacher, their rabbi. But he was more than that as we know. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was, great, there was a great calm. <laughs> so he illustrated to them you know, who he was. But he, said, and he, but he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? So revealing to them, you know, who he, you know, who he was. And yet at the same time, doing good. The miracles that you see in the Bible are miracles of healing and of calming the seas, you know, and resurrecting the dead, those types of miracles. In the end time, there's going to come a false uh, prophet who will do miracles that really are not going to do anybody any good. Uh, you know, every once in a while you read about a statue bleeding or some such or some sign somewhere that people see or whatever but you know what good is, is done by those things people are impressed but they're not made any, any better off uh, I'd like to go to the uh, fifth chapter now and uh, again uh, talking about a, one of, a, a miracle of Christ and a twofold miracle that occurs here uh, I want to go to um, verse 22 of Mark 5 okay and behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet. This is Mark uh, 5, uh, 22. And begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for twelve years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. So we understand that faith has a great deal to do with, with God's intervention and his healing. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? Well, the disciples thought that was very strange. All, these, all this crowd is gathering around him. So what kind of a question is that to ask? You know, all these people are, are, are milling around. But his disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you, and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. So he, of course, knew, you know, and uh, he wanted her, I guess, to come forward and, admi and, and, and admit it. It was better for her to come forward and interact with him. But the woman, fearing and trembling, let me let me look at verse 32. I mean, I'm not sure I read it. And he looked around to see her who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. It's interesting that the respect she had, she 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 you know, she she touched him, but yet was afraid. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. 
And so this is just, again, a, a powerful miracle, a miracle where, where you know, good is done and uh, based, of course, upon to some degree on the person's faith that God can do that sort of thing. God is omnipotent and he can heal. And we're to have faith that he can heal. Verse 35, while he was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why do I trouble the teacher any further? And as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. He was going to do this miracle somewhat in secret because there would have been a mass panic. Uh, he, he was already being being crowded, and there might have been a virtual stampede if, if everybody had known what was going on. So there were times when he kept some of these things quiet. Then he came to, uh, to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult, and those who wept and wailed loudly. When he came in, he said to them, Why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talita kumi. You know, kumi is what you say to, in Hebrew if you want a girl to get up. Talita is the Aramaic. In Hebrew, it's Yalda. Talita kumi which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. See, he had to translate it because Mark is dealing with people who didn't know Aramaic or Hebrew. And anyway, what we have, of course, is English coming from the Greek. Little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age, and they were overcome with great amazement. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it. As I said, if this had gotten out at that point, there would have been, I think, a mass hysteria <coughs> excuse me, and said that something should be given her to eat. So you see, he's still concerned about the girl. You know, well, we're all excited, but meantime, she may be hungry at this point. So we give her something to eat. Uh, so uh, again, uh, just the positive activity of, of Jesus while he was in, the, in his human ministry. And as I said, there are very important Hebrew roots to this material in Mark. And I want to come to the 12th chapter of Mark the most critical uh, passage for, for Jews was Deuteronomy 6, particularly verses 4 and 5. You know, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the eternal our God, the eternal is the one. <coughs> there are various ways you could translate it, but that's the thought. Monotheism. That's the creed, you know, more or less, of, you know, the, uh, that the Jews recited. And... Uh, in Mark 12, you see, this, you see that Jesus acknowledged it because, of course, he was the one that gave them the creed in the first place. Uh, Mark 12 and verse uh, 28. Um, then one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And, of course, that's what would a Jew would answer you. Jesus answered him, the first of the commandments is, Hear, O Israel! The Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then you go on to the fifth verse there. And you shall love the, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is the first commandment. Now, it was pointed out to, to me years ago by a, a brilliant uh, Greek scholar. And I often tell people when you, when you become an authentic Christian, you have a Hebrew culture and a Greek theology. It was pointed out to me uh, that he, Jesus Christ here, in effect, it embellishes what was said in Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. It says there, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. But here he says, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. In other words, when you come into church, you don't sort of hang up your, your brain at the door. You know, you're supposed to have faith, but not blind faith. Your faith, your faith is based on, on evidence, and uh, you're, you think and you analyze and you're not a kind of a zombie <laughs> intellectually. You know, you serve God also with all your mind. Verse 31, and the second like it is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Again, you know, the rabbis taught that this was the critical commandment, you know, to uh, as far as the, the, and Jesus himself said in Matthew seven twelve, as I said yesterday, uh, you know, that do, treating others as you would be treated uh, is, is, the, is the core of the, of the commandments. 
So Leviticus 19.18, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the second, like it is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, well said, teacher. This, of course, is really funny. You know, it's like going to the, uh, to the greatest uh, basketball player and, uh, you know, evaluating how he plays. Who are you, who are you to do that, you know? Uh, this is kind of, I mean, this is kind of funny that Jesus has to have the scribe evaluate his comments. You know, to me, I, I, it's humor in the Bible, in my opinion. You know, so the scribe said to him, "Well said, teacher." You know, like talking to God and saying, "Yeah, you really got it right." Well said, teacher. You have spoken the truth. For, by the way, I was going to do a whole lot more. <laughs> I see. I don't, my time is, is is shortening. That it's good to be better to have more to say than less, right? So the scribe, I, I was told years ago when I, when I was in a speaking club, you know, that you should let that, leave them wanting more rather than dragging it out, you know, when they think, think when is he going to ever shut up, you know. We leave them wanting more. Anyway, but here we are, verse 30, 32. So the scribe said to him, Well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God and there is no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. So it seems like he's sort of waxing eloquent, showing Jesus how uh, zealous he is. It seems, you know, looking at it now, it seems he's kind of waxing eloquent in front of this rabbi. Now, when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But after that, no one dared question him. So they saw that they weren't going to trip him up. You know, he, 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 they couldn't really get him in trouble by, by what he's going to, by asking him questions and getting answers. It wasn't working out, you know, so they, they figured they better come up with some other kind of a strategy. Now, it's interesting that if you, if you think about monotheism, it's a very important concept in the Bible. There is only one God. On the other hand, if we look, put all the scriptures together, we see that God is one in three ways, you know. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And even the monotheistic creed of the Jews in a, in a way implies that. You know, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord is one, but the Lord is mentioned three times in that verse. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. So yes, there's one God, but he's one in three ways. Anyway, that's something to think about. Uh, I want to now go to the conclusion of the book of Mark. And... Uh, there is a passage in Mark at the end that some doubt was part of the original book, but evidently the Greek Orthodox Church does include it and does read it, and uh, it is a, a summary of the role of the church you know, through the eighth centuries. And so uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, finish with it. Uh, I'm going to jump to verse. Um, well, I'll jump to verse 14. Later, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table. And he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Well, you know, it was just a very difficult them, thing for them to really accept that he would, he would rise. But eventually they all came to accept it and many were martyred, uh, you know, because of their commitment to, to what they knew. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, in other words, different languages that they had never studied, that they you know, no normally wouldn't have known. That's a miracle. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will it by no means hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. So these are various signs that he spoke about. But it, it, we, we have to then look at other verses and clarify uh, the, the situation. These are general statements about signs that would occur. We don't go out and try to do dangerous things uh, expecting to be saved just to prove how spiritual we are. I'm, I'm in a part of the country where that was, that was done. I think right around here we had, we had people that deliberately tried to handle snakes. And, and I, want to, uh, I want to take the time to go back to Matthew. I, I, I covered Matthew the other day. I want to go back to a passage in Matthew, the fourth chapter, to keep in mind in, li in light of what I just read. And uh, so I'm going to the beginning of Matthew 4. 
So these are, this is a general statement about signs that would accompany the, uh, the proclaiming of the gospel, but we have to then look at other scriptures to clarify um, more fully. But I want to go to, to, uh, to, to uh, the fourth uh, chapter of uh, Matthew, and uh, I want to go to verse 6. Is that okay? Here we go, Matthew 4, 6. Satan is tempting Christ and said to him, you are this, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself, we'll have to go to verse 5. Then the devil took him up into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. So he's high up, you know, like I'm, I'm kind of in that situation here. Those of you who are watching me, if I walk out on the porch, I'm looking down at quite a, quite a, 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 a drop if I were to uh, slip, you know. But there's a, there's a rail there. Anyway, and, he's, and he said to him, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. Psalm 91, right? And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Also Psalm 91. The Bible says you can be protected, so go ahead and, uh, and, uh, and throw yourself down from this high spot, you know. And Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 6.16. So you shall, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So you don't go out of your way to do dangerous things to prove your spirituality. That's not the point of this. But there are signs that God did provide for the church miracles, especially in the early days to jumpstart the church, to get it growing. And I think we find, you find in your own life, I've said this before, that in your early days in the church, you often find, I think, when, if you think about experiences you've had in others, when you're first baptized, it seems miracles occur to sort of, you know, encourage you. Yes, you did the right thing. It's good you made that commitment. Uh, anyway, I want to go on to verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, this is Mark 16, 19, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. Amen. So from that day to this, the church has continue to fulfill that responsibility of proclaiming the gospel, which I hope I have somehow or other done this morning. So again, I appreciate your interest in these messages and I hope that they're benefiting you and that they will benefit you during this festival season and long beyond that. All the best to you and yours.